Ephesians 5. Let's get started here this morning. Ephesians chapter 5. And make sure everything's running. And uh, we're going to go back into Ephesians 5 this week and next week and just kind of begin to draw some uh, conclusions of the last, uh, this is actually lesson 15 of the big picture. And I want to kind of begin to bring some of everything we've been looking at to, a, to some conclusions here as we launched out of verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And we spent time looking at it, what it is to be filled with the Spirit. What it is to have the, the Spirit of God, the truth of God, the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. The sound doctrine come and grip your life and then begin to uh, influence and to begin to be in, instrumental in that. And as we did that, we kind of left the be drunk with wine alone. And then we've gone back to it. And again, when he says, be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, he's not talking about drinking, uh, like going out and getting, you know, having a hangover the next morning. He's not talking about that. Rather, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, he's on a deeper plateau. He's on a higher understanding level here. Quite honestly, I'll be honest with you, when I hear preachers or teachers and they go, oh, be not drunk with wine and don't go out there drinking, you know, stay away from the Budweiser, have the Coors Light, you know, whatever stupidity that they do. It is literally a show of their ignorance of the Word of God. Because Paul has left the foundational things. He did that in Romans. In Ephesians, he's assuming you have studied Romans and Corinthians and Galatians and are ready for some advanced doctrine. And what happens is, is we hear that, so we just kind of, you know, and off we go, and we fail to look down deep into what is actually going on. And we've been doing that. We, I've, at least I've been trying to do that with you. We'll go back into chapter 3 and how we, how we impact the heavenly places and the angelic realm up there and how our job right now in time as ambassadors, as we live who we are in Christ and as we do what we're supposed to be doing, again, to the best of our ability, we're never perfect. And if you think that you're going to be perfect, then you're going to have a very rude awakening one day. And so don't think that. Hey, you're imperfect. We, he understands that. But yet at the same token, he looks at you and says, you need, to, you need to live how you're supposed to live. You're in Ephesians. Look back over at 2 Corinthians 5. And it's very instructive here as we get to going. Last week, we looked at those four trees of Israel very quickly. And we began to kind of see some things here that are happening in the realm. And this morning, I titled the message. I didn't know what to title it. The Ultimate Purpose of Creation. And so I want to get into that. But before that, look at 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 14. For the, li- for the love of Christ constraineth us. What is our motivation? Not your love for Christ, because that wanes. Yesterday, yesterday morning, I, we, we woke up and we're having work done on the pool and stuff. And, and I looked at Linda and I said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of people. And she goes, what? I said, I'm sick and tired of people. Just come on, you know. And yeah, you go right down the road here lately. I, I just like, my goodness, what are we in? Indy 500 again or something. And then Linda, you know what Linda says to me? You're getting older. And I'm like, wait a second. No, I'm not. <laughs> you know, but no, but you know, you, you, sometimes you just feel that way, don't you? Sick and tired of people. Just leave me alone. Oh my God. But the thing is, is you can't, can you? You still got to deal with. Well, you know, she's still got to deal with me. You know. But the thing of it is, is that's so. It isn't your love for him. It's his love for you. And what gets you through that is, and so he says, because the love of Christ constrains you, because the motivating factor is the love and the grace of God in your life, we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live. Notice the two classes of people, dead people and now alive people. See, when you're dead in your trespasses and sins, you're not functionally able to do anything for Christ. When you're justified, regenerated, and you're saved, 
and you move from death to life, now there's a life to go live. We're to live, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I read that and I go, wow, look at that. And then I get backing up and I begin to think about what we've been studying over the weeks and stuff. And it's, it's, just, it's, it's just wonderful to see and to understand that in the deeper level of biblical understanding, get, get uh, you know, high pricey on you here with the big words, then what happens is, is you can begin to understand that there's something that we play a part in that is bigger than just right now. And I know right now is important. Don't get me wrong. You know, gas is up, food's up, everything's up. Well, guess what? Everything's always going to be up. It's going to come down, but then it's going to go right back up. So when you understand how life, the cycles, eh? but when you begin to understand that there's something bigger happening, come back with me to the book of Deuteronomy. And I, I just want to take this morning and look with you here, Deuteronomy 10, at some things that Scripture says about what God was doing in creation, how He views this, and then how, you, because for you and I, we need to understand that. We need to grasp the concepts and the, the details and the, that, to come to under, have the same wisdom and knowledge and understanding that He has, because you and I can understand this. We can grasp this because we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the Word of God working in us. We have Christ working in us. So guess what? We can grasp this. And then when we look at life, we can say, you know what? I don't have to do that. I, I'm going to go do this and be okay. If you look at Deuteronomy 10, notice something here in verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of what? God. See that little G? He and Lord of Lords, little little L, a great God, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not person nor taketh reward. Notice that he is the God of gods, little G's. So when you look out there, he's the head God. And as and, and it's as God that he's going to create and he's going to begin to do some things and he's going to begin to to implement and make some changes and he's the one to be worshipped. That's why in Exodus 20 there with the giving of the Ten Commandments, I gave you Exodus 20 so that you'd know where the Ten Commandments were in your Bible, okay? If you look at Exodus 20, you're welcome. In verse 3, the first of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt have no other gods, little g, before me. Because he is Jehovah. He is God. He's the God of gods. He's the Lord of lords. He's the top guy. All the others out there are substitutes. They're sub subs. They don't compare to him. He's got a plan, and he's executing his plan. Come over to Job chapter 4. We, when we started a few weeks ago, actually, if we've been 15 weeks, that's a couple months ago, I guess, if my math is right, with some time off in there for a trip or two. The thing of it is, is we, we went back and we looked in Proverbs and how that when God created, what did he have? He had that blueprint and he begins, and he called it wisdom and he began to do that's what, what's happening here. All the other things out there are not the goal. They're, they're subs. He's the goal. He's God. Look at Job 4. Notice verse 18. Job 4, verse 18. Behold, he, that's God, put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with what? Folly. Notice that. This is God. And he charges the angels with folly. What does that tell you about the angelic host? They were messing around is right. They, they are chargeable. You know who's not chargeable? You can't charge who? God. But you, he, he turns and then charges everyone else. Come over to chapter 15. 15, 15. So when we begin to kind of, again, pull in some of the strings here that we've been looking at over the 
over the months. 15.15 of Job. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to work of thine hands. A rebellion has taken place. I mean, I was, that was the wrong 15, wasn't it? 15, 15. I was in 14. I was in 14. I'm like, that's not the heavens are unclean. For, uh, 15, 15. Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. He, there's been a rebellion that's taken place. The adversary has fallen. He is Lucifer. Isaiah 14 has come out of. And he's made his proclamation of the five I will be. I will be, ultimating in the I will be like the Most High. And he comes down, and the heavens are what in his sight? They're unclean. I, by the way, I love that. There, he says he putteth no trust in his saints. In, in chapter 4, he said he put no trust in his what? His, his servants, his angels. He's, he's not talking about people, you and I. He's talking about the angelic realm. And in the angelic realm out there, spiritual wickedness has entered it. And the creatures in the heavens and in that realm out there, Ephesians 6.12, against spiritual wickedness and the rulers of darkness, all of that has infiltrated the heavens so that when Christ, when God looked up there at heaven, what did he say? It's unclean. Now, if you think about when God created in Genesis 1, we read the days, and he creates the stars and the moon and the sun. One was to do what? Rule the day, one to rule the night, one was lesser. What is, what's going on in the stars? You guys ever have that app on your phone when you hold it up, it shows you what's up there? And you go, wow, look at that, that's pretty cool. I wonder how they figured that out. How about God wrote it that way? How about God was communicating with his creation through those stars and that astro astronomy out there? How about when in Psalms, come over to Psalms 89, when God created the Maseroth and created Orion and all of that, that he did it for the means of communication. But what happened? Now it's unclean. It's been polluted. So now, rather than having being able to communicate his word through a creation, he now looks over to man and says, let's write a book. Let's write this stuff down, boys. Moses, get a pen. Let's go. We're going to write. And we're going to have a written record now that's going to last for memorial. Why? Because the heavens are what? Unclean. So he's got a shift. Look at Psalms 89. Verse 5, and the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord. Do, do the heavens praise his wonders? Oh, yeah, look at how, what a great creation. <laughs> what an awesome, I, you know, you sit out there, we go hunt and you get out away. We were out in Montana, you get away from everything and you get out and you go look. We were up in, uh, with the dents up there and you get a, this clear sky and you get to look in and you can see the Milky Way, and you can see this. And, and you, all you can do is sit there and go, there is a creator. <laughs> there has to be. This is just wonderful. But notice, verse 5, Thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints, for who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be in reverence of all them that are about him. Wow, look at that. Where's the assembly here? He's talking about in heaven, folks. He's talking about the angelic realm, the congregation, the saints, all of those terminology that you and I can understand and, and reference to a people group. He's talking to them in the heavens. He's talking there, actually the whole psalm here is about the issue of, of the Davidic covenant and the things that are happening out there in the heaven. If you look at verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. But then he says, verse 6, who in the heaven can be compared? He moves up into that heavenly realm, those heavenly creatures, and he says, who up here? Look at what's going on. There's no comparison. And the picture in Scripture is, is that you have God the Father. 
He creates a heavenly host, an angelic people, an angelic realm, spiritual creatures, seraphims and cherubs, and but he also has got elders and watchers and the rulers and the devils and all those guys. All of that is up there. And again, you have to remember Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created what? Heaven and the earth. He created heaven. And when he created heaven, he sets in a structure. Come over to Amos. Amos chapter number 9. Hosea, Joel, Amos. Mm. Amos chapter 9. You see, when he created, and and get uh, Colossians 1. Go to Colossians 1. I'm sorry, verse 16 first. Colossians 1, 16. When he created all of that, he doesn't just take, have you guys seen these um, I don't call them stupid, and that's what they are. But these things where people they go around popping those graffiti things on everybody. You haven't seen that? Good. You ain't missing anything. You know, it isn't him just taking stuff and throwing it in the air. It's him in creation, and we've looked at this where he's placing it strategically. Colossians 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul describing this realm says, for by him, and that's going to be Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. So what do we have? Heaven, invisible, earth, visible. Well, what are we, where do we function? Colossians 1.16. We function in the visible, don't we? Watch him use terminology to describe what's out there, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or All things were created by him and for him. Notice there are thrones and principalities and powers and structure. There's a governmental structure out there. Now go back to uh, Amos 9. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because he doesn't just do stuff for anything. He's the God of gods. He's the head guy. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And in that purpose and plan is structure. You Please remember, God is not the God of, of confusion, of disorder. He's a God of order. He's a God of structure. And within that, he allows things to happen. That's why in Genesis 6, when we were looking there at Noah and the chaos that sin was producing and violence, and it, what did it do? It repented God that he made man. It made him change his mind about, look at the condition that man's in. i got to do something so he, he did something, all right. He wiped them out, the flooded them. But look at Amos 9. Look at verse 5. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt, and all that dwelt therein shall mourn, and it shall rise up wholly like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and he and hath founded his troop in the earth, and so on. Notice He does what in the heavens? He builds his stories. Now, that's not like telling a story that I caught caught this big fish that was really like that, you know. It's not that. It's a a two-story, three-story, four-story, five. It's a story of a building, a structure. There's a structure here. There's an edifice here. There's a, he's laying out this organized structure. And back in Colossians 1, verse 16, we begin to learn that there's some principalities and powers and thrones. And we learn in Ephesians 1, there's some dominions and there's some, there's some mights. And what you begin to learn is you begin to learn that there's this organized structure of government. Remember Isaiah 14, when Lucifer says, I will... Exalt my throne above. Well, what do you do on a throne? You rule. You reign. You're a king. You see, Lucifer knew that there was government. You see, the argument, the battle, the debate, since Genesis 3, the fall of man, has been who's going to run the universe. Whose plan is going to run the universe? God's wisdom plan or Lucifer's wisdom plan? Which one's going to run the universe? It isn't a plan of might because all God had to do is say, Satan, you're done, dust, and he's dust. God didn't want it to be a struggle of might. God wanted it to be a struggle of 
wisdom. Because he put in creation an ability to make a choice. We call it free will. We call it volition. He laid in front of creation, all of creation, the angelic realm as well, the ability to make a choice. That's why you have always had and you will always have good versus evil. Because man has to make a choice on who he's going to follow. So we have a principality. That's a top ruler, prince. You see prince in that word. It's the big guy. Then you have the power. So you've got a top ruler uh, of the nation. He's where it ends. Then you've got a power. Now, power is authority, but it's a delegated authority. It, it's, a, it's the structure of authority. The judge in the court case has power, doesn't he? But he doesn't have might. He can give the sentence. He can't execute the sentence. Who has to execute the sentence? The, the police force does. The authorities over here, the, the, and that's the, that's the might. That's, so you've got power, we're going to delegate it, and then you've got the might, we're going to enforce it. You ever watch Judge Judy? Oh, come on, I know you do. Or the hot court? No, you don't want, yeah, come on, I know you do. No, if you don't, you're not missing anything, believe me. But what happens? You go to, you go to, you go to claims, uh, small claims court, you win the verdict, do you get your money right away? No, you got to go get the sheriff to come out and help you get it, don't you? Why? Because the court can say all day long, Michael wins, he gets it, and Rick ain't paying a penny. Until, well, that's typical. But until what happens? Until someone comes up with the authority to do what to me? Uh, make me pay it, you see? So you've got these positions. You've got a, th- a dominion, that's a territory. You've got a throne, that's where a king over a territory is going to sit. You've got a ruler. You've got these emissaries that run between, like an ambassador-type corps, back and forth. You've got, and then in Ephesians 1, he calls it every other name that's named. Then you've got everybody else. And I, Paul uses that term to catch up the government. And you understand that. Look at our government. Look at a city government structure. It's, it's vast, isn't it? Dan, or Emily worked in the library system for the city of Scottsdale till COVID hit and they were done. <laughs> well, who did she work for? The city of Scottsdale. She just happened to work in the librarian department. If you, have you ever had the dog catcher come to your house? I have. Delivering a dog. I told him he could keep it. Here's 20 bucks to keep it. <laughs> Didn't work. You know what? You know what that guy worked for? He worked for the city of Mesa, and he was under the police authority in the down chart. My point is, is there's structure here. There's uh, come to Ephesians chapter one. There's a there's a there's a reason for the structure. Ephesians chapter one verse nine, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. He's got a plan. The Father's planned something. He's planned something. He's purposed it in himself to do something. When he created, the ultimate purpose of creation, when he created heaven and earth, he already had this plan. You with me? Verse 10, what's the plan? That, In the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. What are the all things? What did he originally create? That governmental structure of the universe. What's his plan? To put his son at the head of all of it. He has this cosmic plan. To make the Lord Jesus Christ the head of all of the government of the universe. Remember in Colossians 1.16, the end of that verse, by him and for him, he's got a plan. They're real, folks. 
These places, those two realms, the heaven and earth. By the way, is heaven and earth real? Then why wouldn't the governmental structure be real? I hear this all the time. Oh, it's not real. It's just this. You know what? I'm going to be honest with you. When you, come to, when you approach the word of God with a what if attitude, you're going to get what if slapped up on you. There's not a wasted word in that book. And if you think that Paul was just filling up the pages with powers and principalities and powers and mights and thrones, then you have, you have never really got a grasp of what God's doing in his book. He doesn't waste the words. This stuff is important. It's important to understand that when he created heaven and earth, he had a plan to do it. That plan was to take his son and exalt him above the governmental of the universe. Heaven and earth is involved in that. You and I are involved in that. And that's the ultimate purpose. And to say, oh, you don't need to worry about it, is really to do yourself a disjustice. Because you are to know about it. He does tell you. You don't look at the rapture details in 1 Thessalonians 4 and say, ah, why bother? Let's just go do this. No, you, what do you do? You get over there and you study them out, don't you? And you get them in your thinking. This is the same thing. The same issue. Come back. Uh, are you, where are you at? I don't even know. Go, Colossians 1. Sorry. Where are you? I don't know. Where am I? <laughs> I'm, I'm in church. Thank you. Colossians 1. By the way, there in Ephesians 1, he's going to gather together all. That's fantastic. He's, he's going to do that. He's going to look over there, and I think about how that's going to happen. Here you are. Here you and I are. We, we're going along the dispensation of grace. The rapture happens. We're resurrected. We're called home. We meet the Lord in the air. We go through the events of the judgment seat of Christ, and he takes us and presents us to the Father. Then then the Lord leaves that presentation and comes down into the universe, and he goes to war with Michael and the angels in the heavens there. We read about in, in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and we see it in Revelation 12. And what does Michael and the angels and the Lord do? They take Satan, and they kick him out of the heavens. And he loses his place the word is place authority occupy ground territory in isaiah he says he takes the heavens and he rolls it up and he shakes out the inhabitants like grasshoppers now if you know anything about what we've been talking about over the last 15 weeks here what is how is how close to everything is lucifer to what god is doing he's just a tick off isn't he he just a little bit. So what do you think old Lucifer's got up there? Well, if seven are good, eight would be better. There's seven places of authority in Paul's list, okay? Eight would be better. So what do you think the Lord says? I don't need eight. I need six. I need seven. I like seven. Let's go with seven. So what has he got to do with that eighth one? He's got to do what with it? Shake it out. Then you and I, the Father takes you and I and he places us into those heavenly places. Meanwhile, back on the earth, back on the farm, the prophetic program's carried out. The second coming occurs. The, the city, great Jerusalem, the holy city, comes down, sits. The kingdom is established. city comes, new heaven, new earth, off you go. And I go, wow, we're, we participate in that. And it was done that way by God's design. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. You know what? That's where they're located. Where are they located? Heaven and earth. Visible. And invisible. What? Heaven and earth. Heaven would be invisible. Earth would be... Are we winning any awards here on, you know, master level? No. This is very basic. Understanding it. That's why Paul, he says, 
he, the rudiments here, rudimentary, very big. We're in Colossians, folks. We're in the higher echelons of advanced doctrine, and yet what is it? It's where you can get it. You don't need a Ph.D. and a Th.D. and more degrees after your name than your thermostat has on there. You, it's right there for you. Think about that. What are they? Thrones? Dominions? Principalities? Or powers? That's the structure. There, there are things that are going on here that in that spiritual realm, in that spiritual world that you and I, we can't see them. Remember Elijah? He's got his guy with him. He says, Lord, roll back the screen. And he rolls back the screen, the heavens, the screen. And he can able to see what? All those armies that were there. Man, what a... I told you there's angels sitting in here watching us, listening to us. We have that impact on them. And yet... What begins to happen here? Well, they're in the hands of who right now? Well, go back there to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there are spiritual creatures out there that right now have control over this, these realms in the heavenly places. By the way, it's interesting, something to think about. Paul, does, Paul says high places in 12, not heavenly places. And there's a, there's a reason why, and we'll get into that down the road, okay? Psalms 89 with me. Psalms 89, go back there. You think about this. What do we learn from Paul? We have a governmental structure out there. We have ranks. We have stories. We have high places. We have all of this, this thing, uh, this structure of, of control, of government that's there. Now, who's occupying them right now? The spiritual wickedness. Look at Psalms 89. Look, if you will, at verse 6. For who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Nobody. Isn't that interesting? No one. But who's there right now? The angelic realm. Hold on here. Look over at Isaiah 45. Just, oh, sorry. Detour. You know, get going. Down the road. Rabbit. Tennis ball, you know. <laughs> Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. It's just fascinating when you begin to think about this. Isaiah 45, 5, the Lord says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God besides me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Isn't that interesting? Look, drop down to verse 20. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that, that set up the wood of their graven image, and pray unto a God that cannot save them. Tell me, tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this and from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. There is none else. How many gods are there? There's a bunch, but there's only one top God. Now go back to Psalms 89. What's going on? Who in heaven can stand up to him? Well, who's in heaven? Who's in charge of the heavenly ranks right now? The adversary is. Lucifer is, right? Okay, we're going to go deep here. Doot, doot, periscope down. Here we go. Who's, who's up? To, spiritual wickedness is. The rulers of the darkness are. But none of them can compare to who? Him. To the top dog. To the top dog. Top God. He's not a dog. He's God. Verse 7. God is, that's, yeah, dyslexic. I'm not that. 
God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be reverenced of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong God like unto thee, or, I'm sorry, a strong Lord unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? There they are. Who's round about him? This angelic realm. Flip back to chapter 82. 82. Look at verse 1, 82, 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judge, judgeth among the gods. Who are we talking about here? The angelic realm. Notice how they're called mighty. Notice how they're called gods. Notice how they're, again, in, but the question in 89, 6 is, who amongst you can stand equal to me? Look at 82, look at ver- Psalms 82, look at verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. He has a congregation, verse 1, an assembly of, a, of angelic creation. And he calls that angelic creation all the children of the Most High. Remember what does most high mean? Possessor of heaven and earth? They're his children. God has an unseen family. A family in the invisible realm out there. That is joined together, organized together for the issue of service. You remember what an angel is. An angel's a ministering spirit. Servant. Come over to Job 38. Job chapter 38. They don't just float around out there. Job, Job chapter 38. The angelic realm, they're, they're assigned service. They've got jobs to do. They've got parts to play. They've got things to do. They don't, they're not just floating around. You know, Jacob sees that ladder. He sees the, ascent, the angels doing what? Do you remember? Descending and ascending? No. Ascending and descending. Why? Why are they going? Why are they leaving earth and going up? Because the goal was to, for him to have his throne sit on the earth, in that territory, in Jerusalem, in Zion, in the land. And they're going about doing, they got work to do. Job 38, look at verse 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon the founda- are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Look at that. When the morning stars sang together. What was Lucifer's name, Isaiah 14? Do you remember? Son of the morning. Morning stars. Here they are. They're gonna, what are they going to do? They're singing, aren't they? Look at that. There's, there's the choir, the angelic choir, the original, you know, tabernacle choir. There they are. All right? No, they're singing. And all the, notice, sons of God shout for joy. Morning. You get up now, nowadays you get up. About 9 o'clock, the sun finally comes up, you know. What, do you, what are you looking for in the sunrise? Those first little gleams of sun ray, light. It begins to, to open. When does God bring light? Do you remember in our study on creation? Day one. He said, let there be light. He shined light so that there, so that who could watch? That angelic realm. Now, Look at a term, look at the term sons of God. Because when God created creation and the creatures, the angelic realm as well as man, his intention, his purpose, his goal was to always have sons. Okay? When Paul talks to you and I about our adoption, it is the adoption of sons. 
We are the sons of God. There's an issue here that you can't miss in the issue about being a son. Adoption in Scripture has nothing to do with the way we think about it in society. It's having to do with the placement of the, the, the status, your position within the family. Not coming from one family into another family. You're already in the family. And because you're in the family, by the way, how'd you get in the family? Trusted Calvary. You're in the family. Now you're going to be dealt with as an adult, as a son. And the son in Scripture is someone who is fully educated in what the Father is doing. They understand what the Father is doing, and they go join the Father in doing it as an equal in understanding what's happening. Sonship in Scripture is not this great big dialogue thing you got to run forever. It's real simple. The sonship, the son, the person, the individual understands what the Father's doing, gets educated in it so he knows it fully, and then goes and does what? Does it. But does it as an equal. It's wonderful as a father to be able to look at a son and not have to tell them what to do. They, by nature now, by understanding, by learning, do what? Go do it. Now, it took 27 years of education to get them there. No, just kidding. It takes time to educate, right? But they're there, they can go and do. Now, if I'm away, I know it'll get done. I don't have to say, hey, make sure you're doing this. Why? It's being done. You understand? That's sonship in Scripture. He has assigned the status of being a son to the angelic host. Job 38, verse number 7. What are they? They're what? The sons of God. John chapter number 1, verse 11 and 12. The Lord Jesus Christ assigns the issue of becoming a son of God to the believing remnant in Israel. To Israel. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 14, the Apostle Paul says that you and I are sons of God. We carry that title as well. So that's pretty daunting when you begin to think about the ultimate goal over here, the ultimate purpose in creation. He's got a plan to do what? Exalt his son over the government structure of the universe and to use sons, adults, in that functioning in the, in the functioning, in the direction of creation. By the way, Luke 3, I don't know if I wrote it down there for you. Luke 3, verse 38, at the end of that genealogy, do you know what Adam is? The son of God. Son of God. You're, are you, you're in Job. Look over at Psalms 147. Psalms 147. When we begin to talk about and think about this issue about sons of God and, what, and who we are and how we're going to play this and what Paul's getting at in Ephesians 5 when he says, don't be drunk. You're to have a walk of wisdom, walk circumspectly as wise, understanding what the will of the Lord is, and not be drunk with wine. Don't be a part of that religious system out there. Come out from it. Get out of it. You need to be who you are. And by the way, who you are is a son of God. You're an adult in the family of God. It's time for you to grow up, act like it, learn who you are, and go do that and be that because one day he's going to use you in that capacity in the governmental structure of the, of the heavenly government. And everybody goes, well, you can't really know that, Rick. Sorry. <laughs> Baloney. Give you the old New York raspberry there. No, it's right here. You are to know this. Look at Psalms 147. Look at verse 4. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their what? Names. He no they are real, folks. They've got names. The sons of God. He looks at, he goes, Michael, come here. Gabriel, come here. Now, we only know about Michael and Gabriel because those are the last two guys standing on the Lord's side in that upper echelon of the angelic realm. But then you got the angel of the Lord, and you got this guy. You remember the guy in, in, in the Gospels over there, Legion? What's your name? Legion. You know, right? They know that they got names. 
Those demons come out. By the way, I'll get off on that. They know what's going on. They're real. He's got a whole realm out there, a whole family, a whole of an angelic realm. And he looks at them and he says, you're mine. And who, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use sons to put into those places. Think about how he created man. Go back to Genesis 1, just quickly, because this is us. Genesis 1. He created the angels first. By the way, he charged them with folly, didn't he? <laughs> that is fascinating to me. So they are held accountable for their actions. They don't have a redeemer, no one to save them. So the fallen angels are destined to an eternity of damnation. Uh-oh. But look in Genesis 1. We're in the Garden of Eden. God's created man. Verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, comma, after our likeness. Two things there. Image and likeness, they're not the same. Image, a representation of something. It's an image. Man was created to be God's representative in the earth. He's going to clothe him in light. That's the garment that, that the Lord wears. Psalms 104, he's clothed in light. By the way, it's the only creature that has light as its covering. All the other creatures have what? Animal skin. Got to remember that. What happens when they fall? Their light goes out. Now they're going to have a skin. Now they've got skin like everybody else. Our likeness. And let them have dominion over. And he gives them the commission of dominion. Verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over. And off he goes. What are they to have? They're to have dominion over. But what are they also to do? Dress it and keep it. They've got two jobs. They're to take care of it. They're to dress it and keep it. Right now at home, we're, we're repainting the walls and we're redoing the floors and we're redoing the pool and we're doing all this stuff, you know, and everything, you know, and all, you know, it's just like, okay, why did we do this now? Well, it's cool out, right? What are you doing? You're keeping it. You're dressing it. You're protecting it. But then they're to go out and subdue and have dominion over. They're to go out now. And they are to wage a war against the rebellion that's in the world. So what does Satan use on Eve? Chapter 3, verse 5, quickly. So God, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that you, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as what? Gods. Ooh. Where did, we've seen those guys, haven't we? They're the ones been charged with folly. What are the gods doing? They're going up and down and all that. And you know what Eve's trying to do? She's trying to jump. She can't get more than a couple inches off the ground. And she's like, well, I want to be like those guys so I can fly and whoop you do. And he begins to do what? Satan begins to say, you don't look like that. You're different. You're special. You're unique. If you follow me, then I'll give you the code and you can get there. But you don't look like those guys. And you know what Adam does? He falls apart. What did God look at Adam and do? At, you know, people got a strange idea about Adam being dumb. Luke 3, he's, a son, he's the son of God. Adam was created looking like a 33-year-old man, the age of the Lord at his death. But he also had the intelligence of a 33-year-old man. So now everybody makes jokes about, well, how intelligent is man really, you know, blah, blah, blah. But he's not an idiot. He's going to be charged with naming the animals and different jobs to do. The, the first job that God gave Adam was for him to use his intellectual skills to 
interact with creation in such a way as to further develop it, he begins to do what? Adam functions, he gets involved on a genuine, meaningful level of participation because he is a son. Chapter 2, verse 18, 19, 20. When he goes and names the animals, that isn't just an exercise God gave him to do. No, Adam understood what was the will of the Lord was. He understood what the Father was trying to do it, and he genuinely and willingly went over and, be, and with some meaningful participation began to act and to do because he was a son. That's who he was. He was an adult. He's been educated in what the Father's doing. And he goes and does that. And as God walks with him in the cool of the day, and he's educating, he's teaching him, he's bringing him along, Adam, your job is to participate with me in naming these animals. But we're going to use your skills to put it into place. And folks, you and I participate the same way. Our participation is necessary to bring about that ultimate goal of creation, setting his son at the head of the government of the universe. That's how God intended for man to operate. It's how God intended for you and I to operate. He's how he's intended Israel to operate. And that's what God wants done. Now come with me to 1 Kings 22, a passage I have stayed away from these last several weeks because it illustrates this out. God has a way, He has a design for how creation was to operate and how it's to operate all the time. By the way, this is how it operated with Adam. This is how it operated with the nation of Israel. This is how it's operating with the church, the body of Christ. And you know what? It's never stopped. It's always been this way. It's just been different agencies. When he establishes Adam and humanity, and he says, I want you to use your intellectual uh, understanding to come over here and to participate with me and what I'm doing, he doesn't just stop there. He does it with Noah and building the ark. He does it with with Abraham and the covenants. He does it with... uh, Elijah and Elisha, he does it with Isaac, he does it with uh, Jacob, he does it all down through history. And he says, listen guys, here's what I want done, and here's how you're going to participate in that. And he lays it out. Why? His goal is to have adults run his creation. 1 Kings 22. Folks, we're designed to have a participating relationship with our Father. He told Adam his will, now go get the job done. Use your skills to put my will into effect. You know what he's done? Same thing for you and I. What's my, here's my will. You go use your intellect and your skills, get the job done. Now watch 1 Kings 22. In 1 Kings 22, you got some fighting going on here, and Ahab's there. And, and, and back and forth, and you got all of this trouble. Verse 18. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? See, O Ahab said, See, I told you, he's going to do nothing but talk bad about me. And he did. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. Now, Jehoshaphat's going to move up into into a vision here. And he's going to drag O Ahab with him. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left hand, on his left. So who where are we? We're in the mount of the congregation of the north. We're up there in heaven there. And who's around the Lord? The heavenly host. Now watch what the Lord does. And there came a spirit in in the verse 20. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? that he may go up and fall at Ramoth-Gilead. 
And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth the Spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth, and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Now, now look at what just happened there. No, it's not good at all. But look at what happened. Look at how the Lord interacted with the sons that angelic host. The Lord looks on there, around there, and he says, okay, guys, Ahab's got to die. How are we going to do it? How are we going to go and make him go to Ramah Gilead so he'll die? How is he going to do it? What is the will of the Lord for Ahab? He's got to die. It's time for him to go. So he looks around, and what happens? Greg comes up with an idea, Gary comes up with an idea, Joe comes up with an idea, Bill comes up, Henry, all these guys, they come to him. And the Lord sits there on his throne, and what is he doing? He's listening. And finally, a guy steps up and says, I, I can do it. And, and the Lord says, how are you going to do it? He goes, I'll go down there and put a lion spirit in the prophets, and we'll get him there. And you know what the Lord says? That's a great idea. I like that idea. Go, go do it. And then the Lord turns and takes that idea and he says, I say, lying spirit, and go off here. Now, do you see what he did with the, with the sons? He allowed them to have what? Input. He allowed them to have a say. He allowed them to have suggestions. And he even took one of the suggestions and made it the Word of God. In other words, he doesn't create creation to be robots. And to be dictate, just do what we're told to do and try to, you know, do that goofy dance stuff they do. No. He didn't do that at all. He says, I want you to use your intellect and let's resolve the matter. Go and do it. God's design and creation is not for you to be a robot. Come back to Ephesians 5. His design, his pattern, it's for you to understand what his will is, what he wants done, and then go and be a genuine, willing participant as a son, as his son, to execute it out. So in Ephesians 5, when he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's why he says it, because you're a son. You're not a robot. You're not someone playing a, you know, the little uh, marionette guy. You're not doing that. You, you have intelligence that was given to you, you study his word, you see what he's doing. So let's go walk that way. Let's take the, what his will is and apply it to the details of our life so that we can have liberty and so that we can defeat the issues of religion playing into our lives. Cut that, you know, I, I, I love Christian people because when they come to understand the word rightly divided and they see grace and everything, they just can't get rid of their baggage that they bring with them. And it's great to see when people do cut the baggage loose because there's liberty, there's freedom, but it's the way that God has designed everything to work. And the ultimate purpose of creation is to set the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of all, the government of the universe, but it's also to then take sons, adults, those of us who understand the will, understand and go and participate in it with him. No greater thing today than to be able to take God's word, study it, understand what he's doing today, and then go apply that to the details of my life. Because one day, when we're in heavenly places, we'll use that service to the service of Him. And when we see the instructions here in God's Word, 
when we see what it says to you and I today, Romans the Philemon, the Apostle Paul, the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ, see, we don't say all that so we know something better than others. We say all that so we know where to go get the information on how to live our lives. How do I live? When we go do that, then we are given a privilege of being an adult, and we're given the privilege to participate in the execution of His will. And his will is that you would go and live as who you are in Christ in every detail of life. It's not having a all you can eat one day and the rest of the time you're doing, no. It's every day. And that's that ultimate goal of creation. That's what Paul's getting at in Ephesians 5, 17 and 18 when then he says, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Let's be who we're supposed to be, and not be who we're not supposed to be. Okay? All right. Dear Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for who we are in your Son, for the instructions that we carry and have been given to us in your word. And we just apply those to every detail of our lives so that in our life, in time, right now, we would be for your honor and for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.